<laughs> All right. Next up, again, we have someone who needs no introduction, but I'd like to tell you the story of how I met um, KG or Katatsu. So about 18 months ago, possibly two years ago, I found out that there was a young man in South Africa who'd found a way to send Bitcoin over the SMS network, the GSM network. So you don't even have to have a, an internet connection in order to use this magic internet money that we all take for granted. I was a journalist at the time, I still am a journalist, and I thought, this can't be right. It's internet money. The whole point of Bitcoin is you need to use the internet. So I set up a call with him, had a quick interview, and was blown away by not just his intelligence and how sharp this guy was, but also about his memes and his references to popular culture. So if you don't understand the name of the next talk, it's all gonna come clear to you in the next 45 minutes or so. Anyway, I wrote the article, it got published on Cointelegraph, and then none other than Jack Dorsey reshared this article to shed light on what is this phenomenal solution that started in South Africa. It's an Africa-centric or South African-centric solution which is spreading its roots across the continent. It's called, as you know, Machankura, and it enables people to text Bitcoin to one another over the text message network, let's call it. So that's KG. He's our guy who's been running this conference today. And today, he's going to be talking to us about that solution, as well as Dragon Ball Z. Is that right? Dragon Ball Z. Please welcome to the stage. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's good to see you all. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, I lost sleep so that you guys could be here. So thank you very much. Um, So yeah, uh, to start it off, the legendary Super Saiyan, that is what I'll be talking about. So maybe I should give a little background on the title right there, the legendary Super Saiyan. It's a reference from Dragon Ball Z. This is pretty much the best anime that's ever been made. They ever been better animes? Yes, they have. But these guys probably set them up for greatness, right? So it's like, yeah, we all standing on the shoulders of giants, right? Satoshi Nakamoto, that's him right there. And so basically there's an arc in the anime. Uh, it's called the Namek arc. And this is the main villain. This is called Frieza. Frieza is a colonizer, planet colonizer. He goes around planets, colonizing planets, but he's also lazy. So what he does is he first starts with the strongest planets first, beats them up into submission and says, can you go colonize that planet for me or I colonize your planet? Well, I destroy your planet. And so he has the Saiyans working under him, under the threat of uh, destroying the planet. And one day, one Saiyan talks to him wrong and then he destroys the whole Saiyan planet. So there's like uh, a handful of Saiyans left since the Saiyan planet died. Goku is one of the left Saiyans. Vegeta is also another one, but Vegeta still fears Frieza. Now Frieza's in Namek for the Dragon Balls. Yeah, yeah, the Dragon Balls, they grant all your wishes, basically. And cool. So Frieza's killed everyone, and he's fighting against Goku, and Goku, to beat Frieza, goes Super Saiyan. Right? So Super Saiyan is a state of all Saiyans long forgotten that Saiyans could actually go Super Saiyan. It's a legend. And due to how much Frieza uh, caused pain in the world, Goku had to transform to beat him because Frieza has multiple forms. This is his final form. And Goku then had to then, you know, unlock this legendary Super Saiyan power. And yeah, that's background. Now, I also need crowd participation, right? So you see uh, the word Machangura there, I need you guys to read it out. Cool. So when it's all caps, you have to scream. Cool. We're going to do that all through the day. Not uh, at the start and the finish, not all through the day. If you see something in all caps, it means shout it out. If you see something in lowercase, it means just read it out. Okay? So, yeah, uh, first activity. Uh, this is Goku, young Goku, um, back in the 80s or 70s. And he's about to do a Kamehameha. So you're about to do a Kamehameha. Cool. So that is the finishing move. That's how Frieza got killed. And basically, um, now for why we're here, Machangura, is 
for me, I wanted as many people in Africa using Bitcoin as possible, right? And I was looking at the constraints. Not everyone has an internet connected device, so how do we do it? Uh, this already happened in Kenya. Uh, in Kenya, they made digital payments work using M-Pesa all the way in 2008, and in a year they had millions of people using M-Pesa. And you, um, mobile money, M-Pesa, worked over USSD. Right. And yeah, basically we are doing the same thing. So we take uh, the USSD network and we make it work uh, using Bitcoin. Huh? And so a few other things needed to happen because you know uh, Bitcoin addresses are not native to the. Um, uh, uh, telecom network. So we had to implement lightning addresses so that a person could have a lightning address that's their phone number at 8333.mobi. And now this person can receive sats from the rest of the lightning network and send sats to the rest of the net lightning network by typing out a lightning address. Uh, it requires 20 seconds, blah, 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 blah. I'll be technical in the workshop. Cool. And yeah, so um, once the project started, I I made this logo personally, right, using SVG. Uh, there's code that produces this logo. If you want it, I can share with you Node.js code. And this logo basically explained to me why I was doing this, right? We don't have good infrastructure in Africa to do most of the things we want to do. Like, there's 30% internet penetration across the continent. But we have good cellular infrastructure, right? 80% of all the people in Africa have access to a cellular mobile connection, have a SIM card. So what can we do to leverage that old infrastructure to deliver Bitcoin, right? And so that's why I have an old telephone there and outside it's a B, but you know, it's also like a phone booth. Uh, so it's like housing the old uh, thing. And yeah, so cool. Why self-custody? Since Machangura currently exists as a self-custodial, as a custodial service, so I hold Bitcoin on behalf of the users of the service, and it works, you know, it, it can scale as much as it needs to, blah, 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 but then why self-custody? Uh, as Ray says, you know, there's a target on my back since I am custodying these funds, either uh, personal security or government. As I said, Freezer doesn't want or inter is interested in... What's the word I'm looking for? Colonizing each and every planet himself. He just goes to the you know strongest people and says, you do the colonizing on my behalf. So regulations, basically, if you're running a custodial service, you will be regulated in a manner that you are morally against, effectively, you are forced to. In South Africa with FSP laws, I am a um, crypto asset service provider. So as a crypto asset service provider, I have to implement things that do not go in line with why um, Machangura was built out. KYC, blah, 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 uh, risk profiling, blah, blah, blah. And all of those things, what they effectively do is they make it expensive for me to run the service because if a user, I have to pay to do a risk assessment and a compliance check and a KYC check, whatever. So if I don't believe a user is going to make me back a certain amount of money by however many times, um, then I, it's not profitable for me to onboard that user. So as a custodial service, better not onboard that user. I mean, as a custodial service, I better not onboard that user. It's too expensive. So. Yeah, uh, that's why banks don't onboard everyone because it's just too expensive to you know, fill in the forms for millions of people uh, in a country. And that's why M-Pesa actually didn't even partner up with a bank. Right? M-Pesa was like, why would we go to a bank that does not have as many users as we have and that fails to onboard as many users as we have? Right? And they were like, okay, we are a telecom. A person can walk to the corner store, buy a SIM card, and they have the service. So why? Are we not doing that with Bitcoin? So basically, that is what we're going to do. We're going to use the SIM card as a hardware wallet. Right? So if you do not know, a SIM card is programmable. And Ray, I have to apologize. Right? Uh, you asked me a question a few months ago uh, w for when this would be ready. And I said, this fair, but this Jan, right? I'm sorry, man. I don't know how much would go into preparing a conference. So it's not yet ready, but it's... Uh, yeah, yeah, two weeks, two weeks, right? So, 
Yeah, um, you can program a SIM card to do self-custody, right? Because that's what a SIM card does. That's how telecom communications between your phone and the network are secure. The SIM card has a private key and then it encrypts all the communication, so on and so forth. And yeah, um, the programming for that is called Java card, right? Some people call it smart cards or whatever. So Java card is the programming language you would use. And it's quite mature, like uh, in 2015, Oh, oh, almost nine years ago, could you believe that? Ledger had a project which was exploring signing Bitcoin transactions on Java card. And effectively, that is w the foundation for what we are doing. There's been other projects like Spectre Java card. If you use Spectre DIY, you are probably using something like this. And now uh, there's a question. Is cryptography on Java cards mature enough? Right? Fun fact, if in case you do not know, this is the paper Schnorr wrote when he was effectively making Schnorr signatures, right? Efficient signature generation by smart cards, all the way in March 1991. Schnorr signatures are a product of this guy saying, no, man, we need to be able to do cryptography on Java card efficiently, right? And that's why you could do things like Taproot so much more efficiently than other signature schemes because his mission was to make it as efficient as possible and Java card is a low resource computational network and well, a computational environment and Schnorr Signatures makes the best use of that environment, right? So yeah, Schnorr Signatures meant for Java card, meant for smart card development and with our project, we want to make use of that. And so um, current other projects like Spectre DIY, this is just one of their products that's using Java card. So that chip on that card is actually a Java card chip and it has Java card logic. Uh, this is another Java card project, Satoshi chip. So if you've used any of these products, you would have used um, Java card, right? And now these guys, are, um, I find them quite interesting because they sell you in a form factor that is in a SIM card. They sell their product in a form factor that's in their uh, SIM card. And this was the closest project to what I want to do that I could find, right? But there's a reason why they're not doing this and I'm going to get to it later, right? So why a SIM toolkit applet, right? So the reason is these things do not connect to a normal phone. This does not connect to a normal phone. This does not connect to a normal phone. This you can put into a normal phone, but it wouldn't appear, like a user will not have an interface. So a SIM toolkit applet is an applet that appears on any phone. Uh, so that's a screenshot I took of my phone. Uh, it's an MTN SIM toolkit applet. As soon as you put this SIM card in any phone, this app appears. Okay, I'll, I'll just let that slide right there. And uh, I've been hearing it fall. <laughs> uh, cool, 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 cool. Cool. And oh, thank you very much, thank you very much. Uh, but yeah, we, we may have to remove it. And yeah, so then this is how you do it. A SIM toolkit applet is how you program something and make it usable on any phone out there. Right? So then these guys that I was talking about earlier, the fixed on network guys, make an app that accesses the SIM card. Right? So once you make an app, you cannot work on a feature phone. Uh, let's start there, but a SIM toolkit applet can work on any phone, feature phone, blah, blah, blah. Everything should be text-based. So that's what we're going to do. And yeah, so why I was saying the legendary Super Saiyan, uh, this is the legendary golden ape in the Super Saiyan network. Thank you very much. Now let, let it be, oh, someone is there. So, um, and so I feel like Bitcoin has so many components that make it work with the GSM network so well, even naturally, right? Um, can anyone tell me what this is? A what? Nope. A what? Nope. 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 N there's a phone number somewhere there. <laughs> Oh, okay, L let me just say, it's an APDU to send an SMS on your SIM card, right? So when your SIM card or, or, or phone receives this message, it will send a, a, an SMS, right? 
it will be able to parse all of that hex data and say, oh, this is the phone number I'm sending to, this is the message I'm sending, and this is the encoding I'm sending it as. So then does anyone know what this is? What? Yeah, this is a raw Bitcoin transaction, all right? So technically, you can encode this Bitcoin transaction, hex code, into this. Like, uh, the last part is like the body of the message, right? So all you have to say is how long the message is. And effectively, that's it. That's all you have to do to send a Bitcoin transaction over SMS, add how long it is, and then uh, mm, right at the end, remove whatever body of data is there, and so on and so forth. Cool. Um, and this is why I think it's a legendary thing. We just need to find a way to bring all of these uh, tech together. So at the current point, I'm at a point of storing the private key, converting it into a public key, converting it into a SegWit address, but my checksum calculation is wrong, so I need to figure out why it's wrong. And sending an SMS, and then I also need to receive an SMS, and then make the SIM card do a specific action when it receives the SMS. So it's very close. As soon as I do the receiving, I could then do like a, a, a prototype proof of concept handout to a few people who want to test it out. And yeah, you will be sharing your address via SMS because no copy and paste in this world that we live in. And cool, will it be open source? This is the question, right? Eh? So the simple answer should be yes. It should be open source so that everyone does it. And, you know, we all have a target on our backs. But the issue is if you are making it open source, you need to make it work on the most resource, um, lowest resource chip you can find so that anyone else in the world can build on it, right? And then that is another reason why it's taking longer, right? And, but... The benefit of making it closed source is you can buy a custom chip that fits your requirements, right? So this is what some of these guys did. Uh, I think the fixed network guys, these guys probably use a custom chip so that they don't have to be resource efficient, right? Um, and that is a closed source allows you to build quicker, but open source allows you to build freely. And if it's open source, we can avoid the problem that Schnorr signatures had, right? So if you do not know, Schnorr signatures got paint patented and the patent expired, I think, like five years ago or ten years ago, I don't know, right? And now, do we finally get Schnorr, oh, actually, yeah, around ten years ago, do we get Schnorr signatures in Bitcoin, right? Originally, uh, Schnorr signatures were not in Bitcoin because it was still a patented technology and now that the patent has expired, we can use Schnorr signatures, we can do things like Taproot, we can do things like Nostra, we can do all of these weird things that Schnorr signatures are allow you to do, and we could also do them in Java card as well. Um, so, so yeah, uh, if it's open source, everyone gets to do this. So yes, the final answer is this project is going to be open source, and I'll be hosting maybe weekly calls or monthly calls to anyone who would like to get quickly started building it, and the reason is there's only 69 SIM toolkit projects on GitHub. Right? So if you want to look at a sample code source to see how to build out this thing, you will not find it on GitHub because all of them are projects where somebody built and got stuck and uh, deserted the project, build, got stuck a little further, deserted the project, so on and so forth. And all of them are building without a good build tool environment. They are building using closed source APIs, closed source libraries. So. Yeah, as soon, well, I'm, I'm at a point where all the libraries I'm using are open source as well, so everyone, all that, all those months of work, I'm just going to release it and say, okay, if you're going to build on this project, if you're going to build on Java card, if you're going to build a SIM toolkit applet, this is how you get started. This is a chip you buy. Um, yeah, and also we're going to have to source bulk uh, some dev chips because... Um, 
what you will buy is a blank SIM card, but a blank SIM card will not have a connection to the telecom. But you can clone an existing SIM card if you know the private key for that SIM card, which you will not know because it, you used to be able to you know, uh, hash it out, but you cannot hash it out anymore since the telecoms got, um, what's the word, smarter, and you will be burning your SIM card if you try to hash out the private key. And yeah, so yeah, all of that, monthly workshops just so people can get up to speed on how to build on a SIM toolkit applet. And that's basically me, but yeah, we're not done yet. So there's gonna be one more thing, right? Cool, uh, play the video, and it's basically a small demo of how this is gonna look like. just sat there and thought, as if you can do that. That's crazy. Absolutely crazy. Well done, KG. I'm really excited to see that roll out across Africa. H how far away are you, roughly, timeline? It's two weeks. Two weeks. It's always two weeks. Stupid question. Any other, any other stupid questions? I do have lots of stupid questions. Earlier today, we played who is the naughtiest Bitcoiner in the room. We're now going to play the opposite to that. Who is the best Bitcoiner in the room? The most hardcore Bitcoiner, the coolest maxi in the room. And the reason why is because we're gonna have an amazing talk from John Andres coming up, but I don't know John personally and I don't have a fun anecdote to share, so I thought I'd play a game instead. So I'm gonna need you all to get on your feet. Pretty please. I'm gonna put on this stupid outfit. The premise of the game is very simple. It's just like earlier. If you have done the thing, you stay standing, and we're gonna slowly work out who is the best Bitcoiner, the most hardcore maxi in the room. For example, stay standing if you have attended a Bitcoin conference. Just checking you understand the rules. Okay, great. So, stay standing if you have bought Bitcoin. Stay standing if you have lost that Bitcoin in a boating accident. Just looking out for you all. Stay standing if you have paid for something with Bitcoin, if you've used that Bitcoin as money. Oh, that's lovely to see. No one is sitting down. Okay, we need to show this lady here how to buy something with Bitcoin. It's money. Welcome to 2024. Okay, stay standing if you have tried to talk about Bitcoin with a friend or family member or significant other. You're all evangelists. Good on you. Stay standing if you were told to shut up by a friend, family member, or significant other. Oh, you'll get to that stage soon. It does, it does, it does come at you. Okay, stay standing if you successfully orange-pilled a friend, family member, or otherwise. Okay. You guys are really good Bitcoiners. Stay standing if you have listened to a Bitcoin podcast. Stay standing if you have taken custody of your Bitcoin to a hardware wallet, for example. Good Bitcoin is in the room. Stay standing if you have earned some Bitcoin in some way. Wow. Stay standing if you created a Twitter account and signed up to Bitcoin Twitter. Good on you. I actually respect you guys. Stay standing if you have run a node or you're running a node currently. Okay, lots of people sitting down. All you have to do is go to Bitcoin.org, oh, sorry, Bitcoincore.org and click Download. It's that simple. You leave it going for you know two days, depending on your internet connection, and you're running a node. Stay standing if you have read a Bitcoin book properly, not just the pictures. 
Stay standing if you have ever tried to mine Bitcoin. Cool. That got rid of us. Good. Stay standing if you actually successfully mined some Bitcoin. All right. Drinks on you guys. Stay standing if you have started some sort of Bitcoin business or entrepreneurial idea in the Bitcoin space. Ray, you can stand on your chair. <laughs> stay, stay standing if you have successfully spun up a lightning node. We've got some good... Are you guys at the back standing up? You are? Cool, 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 cool. <laughs> Just checking, Ricky. Okay, uh, we're going to have to amp these up a bit. Stay standing if you've tried out Nostra properly. Like, you didn't just download it and, you know, you, you, you know, sent a few notes or posts, rather. Yep, cool. Stay standing if you have been to El Salvador, Bitcoin country. Sorry, Oaken. Sorry, Ricky. Who, who else is standing? I can't really tell. Anyone standing? The camera guys. I only orange pilled you yesterday. I'd be very surprised if you're... I think it's Ray. It's Ray. We're all happy with that. Ray! <laughs> Ray, you win 10,000 sats from me and two Bitcoin books to give out to people. There <laughs> you go, man. The most hardcore Bitcoin in the room, Ray Youssef. Who would have thought it? <laughs> well done. Um, if you're interested, the, the next sort of levels were contributed to Bitcoin Core and the final one was conversed with Satoshi Nakamoto over email, just in case there was someone really hardcore in here. Okay, fantastic.